And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man had seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. Just look at somebody and tell them the proof is in the sacrifice. I gave consideration to to talk and uh, about this today not to I didn't want to holler at you and hope but the significance of being in a relationship with a God who as the writer said none of us has ever seen and the question always arises it, how do I express my spirituality I think it becomes critical because we live in a world that is confused and I say that very carefully because we have fallen in love with the world that God gave us to take care of our creature comforts so we could have a relationship with him. Let me, I didn't intend to go this way, but let me go this way. He created simply to reveal. He created you and I to be receptacles of his revelation to us. And, and when you give some, some consideration to the way you live and the way we operate, and that is that when we live our lives and we enjoy our lives, we want to share it with somebody. None of us live and enjoy life as an island and you actually want somebody to compliment your beauty compliment your intellectuality compliment your wisdom your sagacity and many people live I fish for compliments sometimes you know I, no I, I, I uh, the, the fellas say to me all the time my, my friends get finished preaching and they they run straight to the back and they never come out. And I make it my business to come out so I can get the review. There, there, is, there are those of us who check social media every day. I don't. I don't look at it at all. But there are certain people who check it every day and make sure that they get whatever review there is as it relates to who they are. Because when you're good to people and when you're expressing your love for someone, you like a response. Now understand that now, but put it in a greater picture and see God. In his majestic, splendiferous power. He, if he created all things and all things were made by him and nothing was made that was not made by him, then he was without anybody around him for quite some time. Remember, he's eternal. He always existed. So which means then 
that in order for anybody to understand the grandeur of who he is, he has to create. It sounds reasonable. He has to create and he has to create a creature that has the capacity to grasp who the creator is. Now, and I don't say uh, uh, or uh, 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 when I'm thinking I just stop talking. No filler in for me. <laughs> the attitude then of the creator is of such that he creates beings in his image and in his likeness. Notice what he does. He creates the image and the likeness of himself in who it is he wants to receive his revelation. Now, it's a critical piece here because Jesus becomes the expressed image of God bodily. So if he creates in his image and likeness and God in the revelatory expression as the father is omnipresent, which means he has no shape. If he is everywhere, I didn't mean to work this hard today, but what is making that noise? If he is everywhere, then what is his shape? So Jesus becomes the express image of God bodily. Which means when he said, let us create man in our own image as the omnipresent, omnipotent, immutable, eternal God. If he's creating man in his image, then whose image is it? If he has no shape. Should I give you a clue? Jesus came after Adam. But Adam was created in Jesus' image. Because Jesus is the expressed image of the Godhead bodily. So whenever God made an image in his likeness, then the pattern was Jesus. So even though Jesus came after Adam, Adam was created in his image. And I, I, oh Lord, now. Everything in the world then was fitted and put together before God made the man or the woman. And don't get sexist about this. He created male and female in his image and in his likeness. So don't get sexist about this. Amen. Uh, what did James Brown say? It's a man's well. Did y'all remember the other part? <laughs> In the same way that God then put everything in place before he made
the man. And after he made the man, he became a psychologist and he said it's not good for man to be alone. The question arises, my brother, how is he alone if God is there? And the answer to that is simple, and that is that God does not cross over. My relationship with God is not social. My relationship with God is not material. It's not intellectual. My relationship with God is spiritual. Which means I can have a high time in church and go home and be sexually frustrated. I don't see too many children in here. And I tell you all the time when you say the Lord is my husband. The Lord is my wife. <laughs> my relationship with God is spiritual so I can be alone and still have God in my life. If that is so then, he creates everything and puts it in the world for my creature comfort, for my physicality. Because remember now, he created man in his image out of the dust of the ground. Then he breathed into him the breath of life. So my corporality, my shell is made out of the dust of the ground and has to be supported and fed and maintained by what he created me out of. I don't care how I preach to you, you're going to be hungry. I give you spiritual food, but you got to go somewhere and eat. And you're going to eat out of something that God created that came out of the earth. And if you're even eating meat, even the cows got to eat something that comes out of the earth. Because the world was made for us because our corporality and our physicality is out of what God created yeah. then he makes us in his image and his likeness so he has to give us dominion he has to give us priority and top privilege in the world because his image is not going to be controlled by a four-footed beast his image has to be dominant because when he looks in the world he does not want to see his image subjected to anything else that he created because he didn't intend to reveal himself to a cow. Now, I got to take it further because the problem with the world is we serve the wrong thing. Let me, let me, let me. Let me go deep before I go higher. And I can hoop any time. Mm -hmm. oh, there ain't no anointing. It's just, just me. Everything around us was made to support our physicality. To give us strength so that when God came to visit, we would be already taken care of. Have you ever been, it's a Martha and Mary kind of a thing. 
Martha was always busy. Mary was always sitting at Jesus' feet. Let me put this another way. My job is to teach and to preach, which means somebody's got to take care of my physicality and make sure I get the right food, make sure that I'm taken care of, make sure that I don't have to go get on a job because it's very difficult to be on a job and study. So with all the Marthas I have, I had better be Mary. I went to teach a Bible class, Bishop Jakes's, and I got up and said, well, there's about 6,000 people. I said, anybody got a question they need to ask? And the bishop looked at me like, man, you're way out there. <laughs> but my response is really simple. If you're paying me to be a Mary, I'm going to be the best Mary you can find. So because I know you've been busy all week taking care of your business, and I've been busy all week studying to talk to you, you will go to the end of your limit to ask me a question I couldn't give you an answer to. because that's what I do, study. What the Lord is looking for to reveal himself is not a lot of Marthas. What he's looking for is a Mary. Somebody who's willing to sit at his feet to grasp the revelation of who he is. Let me, let me put it man, woman. Let me just make it man, woman. If your man is taking care of you, Mary, then you can't have a lot of time that you don't spend with him. I wish somebody would understand me. If he is supplying your every need, when he calls, you better answer. I'm out here working for you and I've allowed you the freedom to operate all day long. And when I come in the cool of the evening to reveal myself to who I created, I need your undivided attention. When I reach for you, it ain't no time to talk about watching the TV. When I reach for you, you ain't got no show. I'm the only show you got. I didn't put shoes on your feet, a dress on your back, put a car in the driveway, put you in a nice house for you to ignore me. The devil is alive. Ready or not, here I come. see the creator so marvelously gives us things but what we have not noticed is the challenge of our relationship with God is not God or the devil Jesus never put the devil as his opponent when he says 
You either serve God or mammon. Not the devil. The choice wasn't between him and the devil. The choice is between him and things. Oh, I'm getting to the sacrifice. You cannot serve God and mammon. You'll either love the one and hate the other. And the reason why it is, so, it is so complex is because it's so natural to take care of our physicality. So what we end up doing is we end up laboring for the thing that perishes. Instead of enjoying what he gave in order for us to be comfortable to receive the reason he created us. I mean, when Joe hit me with that, I said, I'm going to the scripture because the scripture encompasses a lot. When we live a life outside of purpose, We struggle to find happiness. Because when you're outside of your purpose, you don't see the glory of God. Because God moves in purpose. My purpose is to enjoy the revelatory experience and everything else is secondary. One of the greatest statements ever made in terms of understanding God is I will bless the Lord at all times because I was created to bless him. And regardless of my circumstance, he does not give up his praise because I'm broke. He intends for me to praise him and give him worship if I don't have anything. Because here's how he put it and here's how he locked us down. Let everything, let everything, let everything that have breath. Didn't say nothing about a bank account. And say nothing about how rich you are or how poor you are. Let everything, because I created everybody to worship me. It is social mismanagement. Why some of us are abjectly poor and others are enormously rich. It's because when God created us in our Im his image and likeness, he gave us dominion because nobody else he created was to receive the revelatory experience. And when he looks in the world, he wants to see his image in control of the space. Uh, touch 
your neighbor and, and say, neighbor, to get out of the back seat and start driving your own life. He gave us dominion, but he never said love it. In fact, he said love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Because if you love it, then the love of the Father is not in you. Jesus, help us. Man, I am not supposed to kill myself over something that was made to keep me alive. So I'm working two, three, four jobs, hustling every way I can. Because somebody else set a standard for how I ought to live. Talk to me, saints. And the sad thing about it is that we who are supposed to extol and promote the virtues of God have spent a whole lot of time preaching money and things. So we had a church full of folk who credited a whole lot of stuff in the name of being blessed. Uh, now, if one of you precious saints want to bless me with a car, don't bring me a payment book. Amen. If you bless in me, then somebody else got to pay the price. Oh, I hope you see where I'm going. When I'm laboring because somebody else set a standard of how I ought to live. I'll give you an example. If you roll up to Beverly Hills, stop by one of the hotels, and you got a little raggedy looking kid that's rusted out, ain't nobody running to that door. Amen. I, I was in Monte Carlo. I, I thought I was sharp. I held on a Mugler uh, silk, had a silk t-shirt on, and I landed in Nice and rented a car and drove across France to, to Monte Carlo, Chateau de la Chevre d'Or. And got me a little Mercedes, I thought I was doing all right. I rolled up to a restaurant, Louis the 15th, and the bellman, big hat on, he, he wouldn't even, the doorman, he wouldn't even look at me. <laughs> and I put my head out, I said, parlez-vous uh, uh, anglais, uh, monsieur? He says, oui. I said, this is a Mercedes, man. Why are you not in no hurry? He said, look around. <laughs> he said, look around. Ferraris, Maseratis, Lamborghinis, Bugattis. It was a billionaire row. So I, I did the next best thing. I hit him with 100 francs. He came and got my car. 
The point is that others have set the standard for how we live. And we're very upset with ourselves if we're not on the level of billionaire. What are the shows now? Kardashian. So all of us are feeling inferior and less than we ought to over what's in our closet, what's in our driveway, and what we wear and make ourselves miserable because we've forgotten our purpose. Ooh, I feel it. And with all the things we have acquired, we're still not happy. Still searching. Still reaching. With all we have, we still want more. Can't wear the same dress. Can't wear the same suit. Well, you had it on last night. Because somebody else has set the standard for where we ought to be. When he tells us, love me. Don't love the world because you're laboring for something that's perishing. Oh God, help me, help me. I'm, I'm getting old. I'm getting old and I'm trying to make the adjustment. Seriously. The more I see my age, the more I want to get on a scooter. Get some jet skis. Already got two big Yamahas. Can't wait till the summer. To try to be what I'm not. Because we're passing through, Jones. You ain't here to stay. So what do I work on if I'm passing through? Oil of a lay all you want to. Mud bath all you want to. Eat the best foods all you want to. You're still passing through. Ain't nobody here to stay. So what the Lord is saying is, I breathe into you a part of myself. And what I breathe into you is what I'm coming back for. Because from dust and to dust you shall return. But there is a part of you there is a part of you that's going to live on forever. And that part of you is what you make you feel good about yourself not what you have or don't have it's who you are give somebody a high five say neighbor I'm a beautiful person I'm a wonderful human being determine the wonder of who I am and I'm not here to determine the wonder of who you are Amen. but I know the expression of spirituality and I know when somebody is telling the truth or lying about knowing God. You cannot camouflage a relationship with God. You can't hide it, honey. Because he does not put lights under bushels. And a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. 
And when you know who you are, folk got to approach you differently. with loving the world is the love of the Father is not in you. We've been rebuking the devil out of people. We need to rebuke the love of things out of people. Because the devil is not the biggest challenge to the human being. For all that is in the world, and he doesn't list cars, he doesn't list houses, mansions, boats, yachts, he doesn't list anything. He says all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And that's all we're struggling with. But that's everything. Because the devil knows what you like. And that's why seriously we have to watch our appetences, our appetite. And the thing that, you know, I don't know about you, but I'll tell you what really bothers me. What bothers me is how crafty Satan is because he's got my dossier. Bishop McMurray, uh, years ago, uh, Bishop would, would talk about the man in the train that had many different things. And he's walking to the train, he'd say, candy, soda, and he keeps calling until somebody hears what they want. The thing that is so disgusting to me is for Satan to know what turns me on. So he don't care how much preaching I've done. He don't care whether I shout until I fall out. All he's saying is when he gets outside, I'm going to see how much he loved the Lord. Because I'm going to have something for him when he gets... I want to talk to some real people for once. You cannot hide it. You either love things or you love God. All the devil does is entice. But you bring the desire to the table. You brought it. When your desire for something is high, it don't take much enticement. Amen. When you want to drink, ain't nobody got to beg you. You'll find an excuse. You'll find a reason for drinking. Oh, man, they talked to me crazy today. I got to, have, you know, I, I got to get me something to drink, man. Say. 
Satan is only an enticer. All that's in the world is coming out of us. So my problem is never objective. My problem is always subjective. So now we get into sacrifice. The best way to spend anything is not to buy another thing. Because that's not your purpose. Your purpose in life is not to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate what you never spend. Your purpose in life is to take what God has blessed you with and bless somebody in his image. And we're not just talking about money. Look at what you have gone through in life. I was sitting with some young men uh, yesterday after the meeting and I said to them, I said, it would be a terrible thing for me to die with the knowledge that I have had over the years and not pass it to somebody who can take everything that I have because my father sent me a letter and my daddy uh, sent me a letter and it's like he, he talked to me from the grave because he asked Linthia or somebody, don't give him the letter till I'm buried. And they gave, him the, gave me the letter after my daddy died. And my daddy said in the letter, he said, no, I haven't left you anything. I didn't leave you a car, a house, or anything. I haven't left you anything. That's one of my regrets. And I wished he had said that to me while he was living. Because I'd get the chance to tell him that I've made my life work not over the money you didn't give me. I made my life work over the wisdom that you gave me. Money comes and goes, but wisdom lasts forever. And whoever you become, share it with somebody. And the first somebodies you ought to share it with are the people who were born to you in a household. Born to you with your flesh and blood. Charity begins. I wish somebody would get it. Because once you bless them, your legacy will continue. Because you bless them, they'll bless theirs, they'll bless theirs, they'll bless theirs and it'll go from generation to generation until we change the face of the world. I'm not here to live 90 years and nobody knew I was here. I'm gonna leave a footprint somewhere. When I love things, and I love things at the expense of loving God. Now let me tie it together. When I love at the ex when I love things at the expense of loving God, I hurt people. I hurt people. Because for the person who loves things, people are always in the way of them getting it. Think about it.
when I love things, I say things like, you the reason I'm in this situation. Because I got to blame somebody for where I am. So I end up being bitter. So I've told, and I've told you, lower your expectation for reciprocity. Because you're giving not in a let's make a deal situation. You're giving out of the abundance of what God has done in you. And the way you show your spirituality is to love everything that looks like God. So let me conclude. My hats go off to people like Everett Glenn, Joe Paul, and myriads of you who throw your arms around people you don't even know. Simply because there is something that moves in you that tells the world this person knows God. Because if God is dwelling in you, you will go out of your way to bless somebody who looks like God and whether they appreciate it or not, I did it as unto the Lord because I've never seen him but I see who looks like him and I love who looks like him because he is love and he is in me. You cannot have God in you and be a mean somebody. Honey, you way too mean to know the Lord, baby. Got everybody running from you. People don't run from you when you're good. They run towards you when you got the right spirit. Can't stand people and love God. Sick and tired of people and love God. Want to reduce everybody want to criticize everybody try to destroy everybody judging everybody and love God when God is in you you can walk in a situation that's messed up and make it right when God is in you your joy comes by seeing people lifted Oh God, I wish you could get somebody to understand. We're builders of one another. We're strengths to one another. We're support to one another. And no matter what we're going through, we can still help somebody. I can't wait till everything is perfect with me before I help somebody. This is greatness. This is greatness. As Quincy Jones once, Quincy said to me, he said it ain't the size of my house and the cars and the planes. He says it's when I need a glass of water before I ask for it. Somebody has it there. One of the gifts of this Bible in the, the spirit not fruit, gift, different, is helps. 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 When God is in you and you're helping and you're busy filling in gaps, anticipating needs, solving problems 
restoring people, putting them back together again. It's satisfying. You know what's satisfying to me? Satisfying. I'm walking down the street in New York. And a man says to me, who I've never seen, he says, aren't you, I think I know you. I say it might be my brother. He says, for the 15 years that I was in prison, if it weren't for your messages, I wouldn't have made it. And I said to myself, when you bless people, you will never know how many you bless until God takes you home. Now, I don't know how many people are blessed, but I got the numbers of who I've hurt. Because blessing people don't cause you pain. Hurting people does. Because the law is that hurt people hurt people when you're hurting you give out pain when you're healthy you give out blessings when you walk in a room you become magnet to the people who are looking for some comfort and God has strengthened you to be able to comfort somebody else. And we comfort them with the comfort that he has given us. And he cannot dwell in me and I be hateful. Restrictive, exclusive. Because he's an inclusive God. And he opens up to all of us. And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Love. Love. Now as I close for the second or third time, all of us have relationships with people who are imperfect. Uh, I couldn't live with a perfect uh, nobody. How was it, how could I manage that? She always right. I mean, how do you manage that? We all have friends and deal with people who are imperfect. And we are very close to some imperfect people. Very close. And, 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 and the imperfection in the person you're close to makes it a risk for you. Give some thought to that. Uh, I was in talking to about 25,000 or 30,000 women at the Essence Festival. And I told them something that shocked them. I heard the silence and people start crying. I said, now, if your husband or your significant other is lying to you, he still want to be there. See, his imperfection and her imperfection puts you at risk. And when his imperfection or her imperfection has gone away from affection, 
Now we're covering it up. A lie is a cover-up. But dear sisters, have you ever asked your lying partner? <laughs> have you ever asked him, why are you lying? Why are you lying? And I guarantee you, you'll get an answer somewhat like this. I got to share that with you. I'm about to tell my dear sister what answer she's going to get. And she preempted my declaration by saying, what I'm going to hear is, I ain't lying. <laughs> Imperfection puts you at risk. Yet you have relationships real tight with people who are imperfect. Because in spite of the imperfection, you have somehow discovered value. Talk to me. And nobody is in a hurry to leave value. So if the fellow's lying, he ain't ready to leave. Now the day you ask him and he give you the blow by blow, the final details, Uh, give me my coat. <laughs> Sometimes Im imperfection is not attractive, but value is in imperfect beings. Because I'm not perfect doesn't mean I don't have value. So when I come into any kind of relationship, I come in understanding there will be imperfection. I'm just asking God to put me in an imperfect situation that I can handle. Because it's going to be imperfection somewhere. I just need to have the kind of value that I can handle that imperfection in you. And the thing about unconditional love. Is that unconditional love makes room for imperfection because unconditional love has the power to perfect imperfection. 